How is everybody doing today? Woo-hoo. Those are the ones still drunk from the club last night. Woo hoo! <laughs> well, man, it's a good Sunday to be at church, and uh, I hope you enjoy this message. Man, we had incredible altar call the first service. My heart was overjoyed. It's just amazing what the Lord is doing today and in this message, and so I hope it's a blessing to you. Again, I don't think that I'm the best preacher, but I think God's word's the greatest or there is. It doesn't get better, right? And so when you proclaim his truth, it just shows up and shows out. Now, there's going to be a couple things that I'm going to say this morning that are going to offend some people, and, and I know that, okay? I know that I had about 15 people walk out of the early service. They got offended. Um, I'm not going to change my message. <laughs> I, truth is truth, and it doesn't change, and so I'm okay. I preached to seven people before. I'm not, it's not new to me. <laughs> Um, And I don't preach any better to 3,000 than I preach to seven. I I just, God didn't call me to numbers. He called me to faithfulness. And so you'll know it when I get there because it's a big hot topic in our society today. But I got to move really fast because I've got a ton of scripture. We're talking about end times and we're talking about the best day of your life. And I personally believe the best day of our life is when Jesus comes back for the church. Amen. I do believe that the second best day of your life is when you get saved and you met Jesus Christ. But your first day is when he comes back. And so, got a lot of scripture. If you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can go on there and you can click events, then you can, or more than events, and then you can find TWC West and all of my notes, because there is a ton of scripture this morning. I just want to say that. So, here we go. When, when Jesus comes back, we're going to get brand new bodies, and you're going to be able to do uh, whatever you want to do, and there's going to be absolutely no pain. There's no more... Uh, uh, throwing your back out, trying to get the remote control. Come on, somebody. When you roll out of bed, you pull a muscle. There'll be no more of that. But Luke chapter 21, verse 25 says, and there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity. That word, again, it just means they got no answers for the problems that are going on. <clears throat> the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, And the expectation of those things which are to come on earth. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your head because your answer is on the way. Come on somebody, that's what it says. And so this is a great message today to get shouting happy. I'm just going to tell you, if you're a runner, you might want to take off running this morning. Come on, nobody grew up in black church? If you ain't got somebody running around, they, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. The Lone Ranger up here. Come on. <laughs> Only one. The rest of us, you know, get there as fast as you can. Go practice at a black church, then come back here. All right? So these are things that have been happening for the last 70 years. And, and I want to say this. I don't believe we're living in the last days. I believe we're living in the last of the last days. Okay? And I believe that we're a generation that will be alive when Jesus Christ returns. And Jesus says, when you see these things that start to happen, your redemption is coming closer. In other words, it's just a short period of time, not over a hundred years, not a thousand years. Jesus said the generation that sees this stuff will not pass away until they're fulfilled. So one generation is going to see the beginning and the end of the last days. But when these things happen, again, we have a promise from heaven, from Jesus, that your redemption, your answer is on the way and to redeem. He's going to redeem us. Redeem means to purchase back. You, uh, you can't buy back what you've never had before in order to call it redeemed. Adam and Eve had everything they needed. They were uh, in a perfect place. Eden means paradise. Uh, their bodies were perfect. They had authority. That's what I'm going to talk about today, redeemed authority. They had all authority uh, and dominion over the world. And Genesis 1:27 says this. Oh, quickly, can we give a big hand to our online campus real quick? Yeah. Thank you guys for tuning in. I hope we're a blessing to you this Sunday morning. And so uh, Genesis 1:27 says this. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. 
male and female, he created them. So I want to stop and say this right here. There's only two sexes. That's all there is. There's man and there's female. And this is just another sign of the end time. Second Thessalonians chapter two says there is an apostasy. All that is, is a big uh, fancy word. And it means there's a falling away from truth and falling away from truth doesn't mean just rejecting the truth. It means falling away from a state of being that I was a man and now I'm a woman, that I was a woman and now I'm a man. You fall away from the state of being what God created you to be. And that's happening in our day and an hour right now. And if that offends you, I'm sorry that you offended. If, if my attitude ever offends you when I'm preaching, please forgive me. But when I read the word of God and it offends you, then bleed, baby, bleed. That's all I could say because I'm not going to change it. And I'm okay with that. I've gone to lunch by myself. You can't hurt my feelings. I used to hold a flashlight for my daddy. You can't do it. I'm just telling better men than you have tried. And he's the only one that broke me down. And sometimes I just wanted to say, hey, why don't you put that in your mouth and hold it? But I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Because as you can see, I still have all my teeth. Verse 28. Then God blessed them pay attention to this, and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and on every living thing that moves on earth. Can I throw this in for free? That's why when you go to SeaWorld, you shouldn't be that amazed that Shamu does what they said they should do. God gave you the authority over that stuff. You can do that if you just put the work in it. You're like, I can't even get my baby to get potty trained. I don't know the... I don't know I'm the best candidate for SeaWorld right now. Well, so God created Adam and Eve, and he said, you are kings of the earth under my authority. You are the rulers of the earth, and I want you to subjugate the earth. I want you to take dominion over everything that come against my will. They had all authority over earth, and I'm telling you, they were created by God to rule the earth. Listen, there's an, a lie, a big satanic lie that comes from evolution that says you're here uh, by accident, you're going to go back to an accident, and that you have no purpose. I want you to know, again, that is a satanic satanic lie. You were created in the image of God and you were created to rule and reign forever and ever. (laughs) Revelation chapter one says grace to you and peace from him who is and was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed our sins, uh, washed us from our sins in his own blood and he made us kings and priests to his God and father to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. See, it's not my opinion, it's God's word. It's God's word, and he has made us. Watch that. That's past tense. And he washed us from our sins, redeemed us back to who we are, and who we are are kings and priests. If you are a Christian, God has called you to rule and reign. He has made you a king and a priest. Temporarily, I'm a pastor. Eternally, I'm going to be a ruler. Same for you. Whatever your vocation is, is temporary. But eternally, you have been made kings and priests to rule. Revelation 22 says, we're going to reign forever and ever. 1 Peter 2.9, watch this. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not people, uh, were not a people, but now are the people of God who had not attained mercy. But now that you've got mercy, you are people of God. That is such great news, man. I'm telling you, that's where the black lips should ought to be happening right there. That is such great news. Anybody ever seen the Blues Brothers? Remember when he saw the light? That's what should be happening right here in this message. I'm just going to tell you. In other words, if you haven't seen the Blues Brothers, you can go check that out. It's even got Ray Charles in it. You can't have a bad movie with Ray Charles music. Some of y'all going to hell. Y'all don't like Ray? That's discrimination. Y'all know he was blind too. I won't, I'm throwing it all on y'all. I love me some Ray Charles. And I got a woman way over town. 
that's good to me. Oh, yeah. I got a woman way over town that's good to me. She pleased me more. Anyway, I love me some Ray Charles. Don't mess with me. I never say. In other words, you have to obtain mercy. You weren't redeemed, but now you've got mercy. You've been bought back. That's who you really are, and you are a royal priesthood. I want you to look at the difference in the message. Evolution tells us we are animals, that we came from nothing, and we're going to go back to nothing, and that you have zero purpose. But I am telling you, you were created in the image of God. You are a royal priesthood. That is who you really are, and everybody here and everybody watching online has a calling and has a purpose given to you by God. Think about it. Right now, in society, Jesus is a mockery. You are a mockery. Christianity is a mockery. Persecution is rising all over the earth. But one day, we're going to get all of our authority back, and all the rules are going to change. Just be patient, saints of God. Just hold on. Hold on. Hopes come, come on, hold on. Jesus is coming and everything is going to change in the twinkling of an eye. Second Timothy chapter two says this, if we endure, we will also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will deny us. That's a two edged sword. That's a promise though. If you endure, if you hold on, if you don't give up, you will reign forever. Revelation 22, and there shall be no more curse. But the throng of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light for the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. You understand when I talk about that heaven is going to be a lot like when I said the Garden of Eden, when it was first created before man fell. You understand that before God created the sun and the moon, that there was a first day when he before the first day of creation ever started he said let there be light and there was how was there light if there was no sun and there was no moon there was no stars that hadn't been created yet it's just like in the book of revelation you won't need light you won't need anything because he is the light you understand when God proclaims a word everything that is hindering that word when he said let let means anything that's opposing what's about to come out of my mouth has to change and become what I said it becomes if God said that is a great looking red shirt immediately this shirt would turn red because his word cannot return void why am I telling you that you need to know this about creation that when God said it without a source it's sustained on of his word and so it doesn't matter if you were a pimp a drug head a prostitute if you've been divorced if you've been reborn if Jesus said you're righteous you're righteous it doesn't matter what the church says the church doesn't like they don't gotta like you because you're going to heaven but they better get used to you because they're gonna have to rule it well they're probably not gonna make it Them ones that just roll your eyes. I can't believe you. You don't, you're not going to go. Don't even worry. You don't got to worry about heaven. You can't get to heaven with hate in your heart. Gets on my nerves when people get saved and forget where they come from. Like, fool, you've been saved for 20 seconds. You already judging somebody. I can't believe they dress like that when they go to church. Who cares what you dress like? I don't see no dress code. Well, it's holiness. Holiness isn't something you wear. Holiness is something you become. Because if they were going on, if it was based on holy, we'd all have some underwear that would get us in. Come on, somebody. <laughs> if you could sell them holy underwear like holy jeans, boy, we would be sitting on some money right now, wouldn't we? <laughs> I got to get back to this. Hold on. I ain't said that in the first service. It just jumped in my head. Pray for your pastor. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. All the time. I can't pray for nothing else. We're praying for you so much. 
Revelation 22 is the last chapter, right? And the last chapter of the Bible, and it's talking about heaven and earth going to be destroyed. So we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. And this is describing us being with Jesus. In Genesis chapter 1, the first chapter in the Bible, it says that mankind was invested with authority over the entire earth. And Revelation chapter 22, which is the last chapter of the Bible, it says what we will rule and reign forever. One of the constant themes, don't miss me, one of the constant themes of our Bible is authority, but we know that Adam and Eve never used their authority. There is not one record in Genesis chapter 1 or Genesis chapter 2 of Adam and Eve ever using their authority. I'm going to say something strong here. All the devil, all of his evil on this earth that he uses right now is unused human authority. You understand what the devil got me. The, if the devil's doing all that in your life, it's because you're not using your authority. All of his authority is unused human authority. He has no authority, and I'm going to show you that in a minute, but everything that he does is in the vacuum of human authority because if someone won't use their authority, the devil will step in and take their authority and use it. Okay, Adam and Eve not only didn't use their authority, but they sinned, and they sinned. They handed the title deed of the earth over to the devil. Here's the record of it. Jesus is talking here in John chapter 14, verse 30. He says, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world, referring to Satan, is coming and he has nothing in me. Now he refers to Satan right there as the ruler of the world. Watch this in Luke 4. Then the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you'll just worship before me, all of this can be yours. When it says it's been delivered to me, that word delivered it actually means handed over. That's what Adam and Eve did in the garden. They actually handed over the title of the earth. Listen to me though. Sin, this is very strong. Sin is not just rebelling against God. It's agreeing with the devil and it's giving him authority in your life. I want you to understand. I'm going to say that again. Sin is not just rebelling against God. It's agreeing with the devil and it's giving him authority. We live by grace, but when we decide to live in sin, we give the devil our marriage. We give the devil our home. We give him our lives. We give him our finances, our morality. When you give him an area of a life, he sets up camp in that area because you've given him authority. So if there's an area of your life that you just can't seem to win or you can't seem to get the victory, have you ever thought it's because you've given the authority to the enemy of it? You come out, I guess we'll always be broke, busted, and disgusted. I guess I'll always be sick. I guess it'll never get better than it is right now. You're coming in an agreement. The devil doesn't have to beat you up. You already got whooping yourself with your own mouth. You've come in an agreement. James 4, 7 says, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If you want to be free from the devil's rule, the first thing you have to do is get under God's rule, get under God's authority. Under his authority, you have authority in the kingdom of God, but you only have as much authority in the kingdom of God as you're submitted to the God, our father. And if you're not submitted, you have zero authority. You can't go out proclaiming God's name if he's not your God. And how you'll know he's God, I'll know that they're my people because my people that love me, they keep my commandments. Not some of them, not the ones they want to do. But they'll keep my commandments. He didn't say, you know, y'all just do like two out of ten. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to let you in with two out of ten. I know that's the, no, he, didn't, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Not what you want to do. So listen to me, if you want to be free from that, you got to give God rule. And if you're in rebellion to God, listen, you cannot cast the devil off his own turf. And his turf is rebellion, just so you know. And so it says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. You know why he flees from you? Because you're now under authority, and he recognizes God's authority. Matthew 28 says this, Jesus is talking, and he says, all authority. How much authority? All. All authority has been given to me in heaven on earth. In Luke chapter 4, we just read it. The devil tells Jesus, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you the world. And Jesus said, hard pass. I'll just go ahead and die and pay for it. Hard pass. Jesus was offered a shortcut, but for your sake and for everybody watching online, he turned it down. 
You understand that. They gave him a way out. Jesus paid for our sins to be forgiven. When he did that, he took the title deed back of the earth. And it says, all authority in heaven and earth is mine. That means Jesus has all authority. Watch me, church. Don't miss me here. Jesus has all authority and the devil has zero. No authority. Zero. What do you mean? Zero authority to harass you. Zero authority to come against your marriage. Zero authority to come against your kids. Zero authority to come against your health. Zero authority to come against your finances. But listen, you... When, when you rise up and you decide to rule and reign, he will recognize that you have been made kings and priests. You are kings and priests. When you take authority over him, you tell him, not today. Not today. You don't get to come in my house. You ain't here to pay the bills. You don't get to come. I refuse to let somebody stay at my house. You're not going to help me pay the rent? You better get up. You're a grown man. Go to work just like I go to work. Y'all not ready for me. I'm mean. I'll help somebody get on their feet, but I'm not going to help you stand on my shoulders. The Bible said you don't work, you don't eat. I'm just reading the Bible. When Jesus comes back, we will rule over the earth and, and the way Adam and Eve were intended to. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 3, Jesus wrote seven letters to seven different churches. At the end of every one of those, he promises a blessing to them. I'm just going to give you one. Revelation 2, 24. Now I say to you and to the rest in, in Thyteria, I, I think that's right. I don't know. That may be like Mexia and Mejia. Nobody knows. Y'all know that, right? The guy says, we're in Mexia. The other guy says, no, we're in Mejia. Another guy says, we're in Mexia. Says, no, we're in Mejia. So the guy walks up to the counter and he says, I want you to tell me right now, right now, exactly where I am. And I want you to say it as slow as possible. So he hears it and I hear it. The guy says, no problem. Dairy Queen. <laughs> That's one of my dad's jokes. Y'all had, had that for free. My dad told me that joke. Revelation chapter 2, 24 says, Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyteria or Mahia, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put you on no other burden, but hold fast uh, what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my word until the end, to him I will give power over the nation, watch this, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. Also I have received from my father. Jesus said, if you'll just hold on, if you'll just be patient, don't get your panties in the wad. Y'all ever heard that saying? It's not biblical, but that's where it comes from right there. Uh, and so... <laughs> He said, I'm going to give you the nations, and you're going to rule with me with a rod of iron. Now, let me give you a time and events. You might want to pay attention. I'm going to give you a time of, of events of what's going to happen when Jesus returned. The next major event that's supposed to happen for the church is the resurrection of the dead in Christ and the rapture of the church. That's the next major event. And, I'm going to, and it can happen anytime. Anytime right now. 1 Thessalonians 4.15 says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. That's our saints that have gone on before us. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Come on, man. And then they, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so it's comforting to know that Jesus is coming back for us. It's comforting to know that those who are dead in Christ will be resurrected. Those, your loved ones that know Jesus, that have gone on, we will see them again and it will never be a goodbye anymore. It will always be howdy, howdy, and hi. Come on. And we'll meet them with the Lord together in the air. And that ushers in the second thing, which is this, the marriage supper of the Lamb and the glorious return of Jesus and us with him. There's going to be the rapture of the church. And then we'll go to the Father's house. In John 14, he says, in my Father's house, there's many mansions. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. If it wasn't true, I wouldn't have told you all that stuff. And he says, I'm leaving, but I'm going to come back. And I'm going to bring you to myself. That's the rapture so that where I live, you can live with me. Isn't that good news? The Father's house 
is 1,000, it's a 1,380 mile cube. For, for lack of better terms, I'm just gonna say 1,400, okay? I don't need nobody emailing me and say, you adding to the word of God. Just, you already heard, 1,380. Huh? So it's 1,400 miles wide, high, and tall. That's a big place. I don't know if you realize that, but you can put a whole bunch of mansions in that place, and you will have one there if you're a Christian. When we are raptured, a seven-year period begins in Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, it's referred to as a, it's about a 490-year period of time that there is for Jewish people. 400, I just want to point this out. I'm not a date setter. 483 of those years have already happened. So if it says there's 490 years and 483 have already happened, you do the math. Math is hard. So um, it's talking about the time of Jacob's sorrow, and it's going to be the worst period of time on earth in human history. It's called the wrath of the lamb in the book of Revelation. But as that is happening here on earth, you know what we're going to do? <laughs> we're at the world's largest barbecue. Come on, somebody. Seven years of barbecue. Who don't want to go there? You better get up and get out of here right now. I'm telling you. It's going to be seven years, a seven-year dinner. Oh, Jesus. Okay? And, and it's a marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a seven-year Jewish wedding where the church, his bride, is going to get married to Christ. Watch this. At the end of the age of the, what, what happens at the end of the marriage of the supper? Revelation chapter 9, verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Watch the wording here. And his wife, understand, no longer the bride, has made herself ready. We got married, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Verse 11, now I saw the heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flame, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. We know that that is Jesus according to John chapter 1, because he is the Word. Come on, somebody. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen. That's us y'all come on white and clean follow we're gonna get to do some cowboy stuff white and clean on white horses now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule with them a rod of iron pay attention he himself tread the winepress of the fearnesses of the wrath of almighty god and he has on the robe and on his thigh a name written the king of kings and the lord of lords that's awesome right there so at the end of this supper, there is a glorious returning. The rapture is a private event. It's only between Jesus and the church. The world doesn't see it. The only thing they see or know that there's a lot of people missing. I'm going to throw out a theory to you. You could say, Todd, you're crazier than a bed bug. Listen to me. I already know that. I already know that. And when I throw this theory out, you can say, we need to put you in a, a mental hospital. I've already been there. I was next door to my mom. And so, <laughs> how many of y'all ate my mom's banana pudding yesterday and carrot cake? Huh? You get filled with the Holy Ghost? Mm-hmm. I knew it. Y'all don't think I got this figure because my mama couldn't cook, could you? So, <laughs> here's the thing. I think, in my opinion, when all these people disappear, they won't be able to explain it. I think they're going to say they got all abducted by aliens. I believe that with all my heart. They're going to say aliens finally, and they're going to pin this stuff out, and Area 51, all that trash will come out. I just, do what you want to with that. But don't go out and preach. My preacher said, we're going to get abducted by, don't you? <laughs> don't you get me. Don't you put me on TikTok. Don't you? <laughs> the devil is a lie. Okay? At the end of the supper, it's a private event. They don't see, only us does. The glorious return is at the end of the tribulation when the church returns with Jesus and then he sets up a thousand-year old reign called a millennial reign between himself and the church here on earth. Now, here's what happens when we come back with Jesus. Revelation 19, 19. And I saw the beast. That's talking about the Antichrist. Uh, the king of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. That's about them coming against us. Then the beast was captured. Listen, he's a punk. 
I want y'all to catch this up. The beast was captured with him, the false prophet. He's got a really tough name, but you understand he got captured? Come on, somebody, you punk. And then the beast was captured with him, the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped the image. There's gonna be people that buy into the lie and they're gonna take the mark of the beast. Um, those two, watch, were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with a sword which came from his mouth who sat on the horse and, uh, on the horse, and all the birds ate their flesh. And it's gonna take seven months to bury all the people that die there, just so you know. And, ho- and the blood's gonna ride up to a horse's bridle. And if you see that territory, it'll blow. I got a picture. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can get that out of my phone and put it up here. Um, this is Armageddon when all the armies of the world are coming against Jerusalem. Now, the last scene in human history is Zechariah chapter 14, and, and it's parallel to this passage, just so you know. The world marches against Jerusalem. Jesus returns. He takes the false prophet, the Antichrist, and he throws him alive into hell, and then he kills all the other armies that have come to destroy Jerusalem and those that come and fight against him. Now, we're there with him. We're flying in from heaven on a horse looking over his shoulder, and he takes these two dudes, and he throws them in hell. There's a rapture. There's a supper. There's a return with Jesus. Then, here's the next thing, the 1,000-year millennial reign on earth. Over the survivors, you need to know this, over the survivors of the tribulation and our total authority with him as his wife and his representative. That's what's after that. How do I know that? Revelation 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and he shut him up, and he put a seal on him. So two are in hell, and devil's in the bottomless pit. Are you following me? Okay. And put a seal on him, so that he should not deceive the nations no more till a thousand years were finished. But after these things, he's going to be led out again to go deceive people. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and the judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. Now, those are the people that got killed in the tribulation. Those are the ones who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received the mark on their foreheads or their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, everyone who has been martyred, or saved during the tribulation now become a part of the church. I want you to catch that. They're now part of the church. But the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part of the first resurrection. That's us. In other words, he says, you don't want to be around for the tribulation. You don't want to see it, okay? Over such the second death has no power but they shall be priests of God in Christ and they shall reign. He's talking to us. This is what'll happen if you go in the first load. You'll reign with him. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, that's Jerusalem, and fire came down from heaven, uh, from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. So that, that's a good place to clap right there. You, I'm just telling you. Let me, let me help you understand this a little bit. I'll tell you when to clap and y'all just jump in. How about that? Jesus returns and he takes the false prophet and the antichrist alive He throws them into the lake of fire. He puts Satan in the pit for a thousand years. While this is going on, we are here on earth. We're ruling and reigning with Jesus. This is the rod of iron that it talks about. The age of grace is over. There is no more grace on this planet. At the end of the tribulation, I want you to understand, at the end of the tribulation, no one will ever get saved again. Grace is gone and no one will ever be saved again. The age of grace is an age. But the day comes when the age closes and there is no more grace. That's why it's called the rod of iron. In a thousand year millennial reign, we will impose God's will upon the earth. You, will re- you realize at the end of a thousand years, they're going to try and kill us. You, we just read it. 
They're going to try to kill us. Satan is loosed. He goes out, gets Gog and Magog. These are just nations that rebel against God, and he's loosed. And these are people that we've been ruling over that don't like the rule, and they're going to try to kill us. Who are these people? These are the people who survived the tribulation. Revelation Revelation chapter 9 says, during the worst of the plagues of the tribulation, they saw death, but God would not let them die. In other words, they wanted to die, but God would not let them die. And and, and the tribulation got so bad that that's what was happening. At the end of Revelation 9, uh, three plagues kill a third of the world. A third of the world is going to get knocked out and, and of mankind. And after that, you would think people would repent. But can I can tell you this? They still refuse to repent of sin and immorality. These are the hardened people who hate Jesus. And the punishment for their sin is living under a thousand years under his direct rule. Remember, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's the Lord. That's going to happen in that period. And God says, you're not going to die. You know why? You've been cursing my name. You've been cursing my people. You've been persecuting the world. You've been corrupting the church. Now you're going to stay alive because my church will rule and reign over you for a thousand years. Now, many people believe when Jesus comes and, and we are raptured, that there's this wonderful blessing of new bodies and pleasure on earth. Stay with me. But many people believe it's just life and then we get a reset. And we go to heaven, and that's really, listen, that's really not true. Every Christian is blessed. Everyone is forgiven. We no longer have a sin nature, but it continues from here. It doesn't just reset. It keeps going. Watch this, Luke 19. Now, Jesus is telling a parable of what happens when he returns. You really want to pay attention to this, I promise you. Verse 11. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. The disciples thought, let me just throw this in there, because they were getting close to Jerusalem, that that Jesus was about to set up his kingdom. That's that's what they thought. Jesus is going to answer them. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered them 10 minas, and he said to them, do business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man rule, uh, reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. The first came saying, Master, your mina has earned 10 minas. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful with very little. Watch this. You have authority now over 10 cities. Catch this. And to the second came saying, Master... Your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you will be over five cities. Then another came saying, master, here's your mina, which I have kept and put away in a handkerchief. For I feared because you are an an austere man. You're a harsh man is what he's saying. You collect what you did not deposit and you reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a difficult man or a hard man, according to him, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might at least got some interest off of it? And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has 10 minas. But they said to him, master, he has 10. For I say to you that everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring those, uh, here those enemies of mine who do not want, to, want me to reign over them and, and slay them. Slay them before me. You see how strong this is here? Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. They thinking he's fixing to overthrow the government and set up his kingdom. And Jesus is like, no, that's not what's going to happen. I'm about to go away. And I'm about to give you the kingdom. Watch this. I'm about to give you, I'm going to entrust this to you while I'm gone. And, and I'm going to give you gifts. Listen to me, church. I'm going to give you gifts. I'm going to give you callings. And I'm going to give you talents. And I'm going to give you responsibility. And I'm going to give you favor. And I'm going to give you opportunity and influence. And while I'm gone, this is what I want you to do. I want you to win souls and build my church build my kingdom. I want you to do good on earth, restrain evil. I want you to do business like I was doing business before I went up. 
That's what he's saying. When I put in these 12 and we went and changed the world, I want the church to keep doing what I did until I get back. So the question then becomes, have you been running the father's business like he was? Because when I return, I'm going to call you into an account. And if you've been a faithful steward for a thousand years, you will reign over a geographical territory. If you picked up on that, every Christian that goes in the rapture will get a new body and you're going to rule over the earth. But did you know that some of you that raise good kids and fight for the right things and who pray and are prayer warriors and you do good on earth when Jesus comes, it's not a reset where everything you've done in this life goes away when Jesus comes. It's just a continuation. And what you've done in this life for a thousand years, you will experience the authority of God based on how you lived your life while he was gone. And for some of you, God will come and say, I'm giving you this territory. Listen, we've never ruled the way God intended. But in this thousand years, the world will finally act the way they're supposed to under the rule and the authority of God. And finally, there will be absolute righteousness, Christian authority, ruling the entire world where we will be the police and we will be the sheriff where we will be the mayor and we will be the governor where we will be the congress and the senate where we will be the supreme court where we will be the president under the authority of God Almighty think about all the evil that's going on the earth right now the answer is God's authority on earth here's the next thing and I'm almost done the great white throne judgment revelation chapter 20 then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face on the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is called the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead that were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to their works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is not a good judgment. This is not a good judgment. The saints have already been judged. The saints have already got their perfect body. The saints have already been given their rewards before this happened. This is a judgment of a lot of evil people who are going to hell and God is finished with the earth. And at that point, here's the last one. We get a new heaven and we get a new earth. That's what gets created. How do I know it? Revelation chapter 20. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. That's us. Listen to me. Verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all the tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no crying, neither shall there be no pain, for the former things have passed away. That's a good place to clap. I'm just going to tell you. As I get ready to close, I want to say this. We... We have lived, some of us here for a long time, some of us not for such a long time, but what I will say to all of us that are still alive, for the most part, we have forgotten who we are. We have forgotten who God has called us to be. We are the kings of the earth. We are priests. We are kings. We are a royal priesthood. In this life, we have spiritual authority and we can rule right now in the sphere that God has given you. What's my sphere? Wherever you work, wherever your kids go to school, wherever you live, that's your sphere of influence. Whenever you're in the line at Walmart or United or HEB or wherever, that's your sphere of influence. What are you doing with it? But in the next life in heaven forever and ever, we're going to rule and reign with him. And we will have authority back the way he intended for us, totally and completely. So here's a couple questions I want to ask you as I close. Are you using the authority that God has granted you on earth right now? I just preached the whole 40 minutes, maybe longer, on you having authority. My question is, are you using the authority that God has given you? 
because you were not designed to be rule over. What are you telling me, Todd? I'm telling you as the bride of Christ, begin to rule. Begin to use your authority. Begin to cast down strongholds, evil spirits. Come on, principalities. Begin to speak to those things. Call evil. Don't be afraid to speak up. Don't free, like I started this message, don't be afraid to start. I know, I know I'm going to get emails this week. I, I don't know why people email me. It's not like I'm going to change. I'm telling you right now, I'm not going to change. I'm going to preach it again next week if the Lord leads me to. But I don't hit on any one thing. It's not just one sin, all sin. I think sometimes, that, you ever notice though we have grace for people that sin like we do? I'm just going to leave that out there for free. We can find the girl that's unmarried and say, oh, I can't believe that. You're pregnant before married. We'll pick her out, but we'll, and then we'll gossip about her all the way home. Am I at the right church? She's like, I thought fornicating, and you're a gossiper. Shut up. <laughs> the only difference between her sin and your sin, and hers going to pop out in nine months. You're going to keep yours hidden, thinking you're all holy. Isn't it going to be funny when a bunch of those pregnant girls go to heaven and a bunch of you get left behind? It's getting quiet in this little Presbyterian church. Are you still with me? Van, you still? Van converted yesterday. Uh, we got him back, I think, this morning. Listen to me. Here's the, here's the last part. What, what are you doing with your giftings and your talents that God's given you? Because he's given everyone in this room giftings and talents and callings. Everyone. Mine just happens to be up here. And yours may not be behind here. Yours may be wearing somebody's house. You're, you're cutting hair. Putting tattoos on people. Oh, I know I just messed with a lot of you. You can't be a Christian. And have, you just read where Jesus is going to have a tattoo on his thigh. What are you going to do with that? No, I'm not going to get one because I'm, I'm too sissy. I ain't doing it. Of course, my dad put, anybody grew up old school? I grew up, I grew up old school. My dad, I tell him, I'm gonna go get a tattoo. My dad said, I wish I would go work all day, bust my butt for pay somebody to draw on me. <laughs> well, you ain't wrong. So that's just the way I grew up. It don't bother me at all. Paint it all. I don't care. It's something to look at. Something to ask questions for. What's that mean? What's that mean? What's that mean? But here's what I want to tell you. There's a lot of people that have an idea of religion that have no relationship with Christ. And there's a lot of you, watch me that have been saved and been redeemed and have done nothing with your salvation. You don't serve in your church. You come here every week. You have other kids watch your kids, but you never think about watching other people's kids. You have people making coffee. You've never once tried to make coffee. We've got people opening doors. You never try to open a door. It's not hard. You've never worked the parking lot. You've never, I, I don't understand. I, well, I'm not called to be a preacher, but you're not called just to sit either. Somebody's already doing it. You're right. You know how many of those that are doing it are going to keep doing it, but would love to have a break? That's why we canceled Wednesday night, so I could give those guys a break. And I had people, when I made that announcement, we're going to have 8.30 for the month of July, and we're not going to do Wednesday nights. I had people looking at me like this. And you know what I found out with a common thread? is none of those people serve in church. I looked around, I thought, none of y'all do nothing, so you don't know what it is. What time do you guys get here today? Seven? Huh? Yeah. Oh, eight. But when we have 8.30, what time y'all get here? Seven. Seven o'clock, worship team gets here. Come on, man, I'm telling you. Some of you are called to be musicians. And some of you are called to sing in your car. Just keep doing that. But some of you are called to be on this stage. And you're like, we already have people on the stage. We need more. We need more. But don't get your feelings hurt if you're a car singer and you show up for the stage and we're like, oh, no, no. I'm not going to do that. But if we start a choir, we're going to come call you. 
because they can out sing you. No, I'm just like, but real talk, what are you doing with your gifts and your callings, man? Are you sitting on them? Are you mad because the last church hurt you or the last pastor did this and nobody recognized you? Well, uh, if you want me to work, you better come ask me. I don't have time to go ask 2,000 people. Are you ready? Hey, y'all want to help? I want a personal invitation. Well, I'm personally inviting you to help. That, that, that's it. And I want to, I'm not bragging my own chain, but when I got saved, nobody had to beg me to work in the church. And you know why? Because I realized I deserved hell. I either deserved hell or I deserved the grave, and neither one was going to lead me to hell. But for whatever reason, God decided to redeem a cokehead and call him to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ for the last 30 years. And because of that, I will give him my life eternally. It always amazes me, people that get saved, that wasted all kinds of money on cigarettes and beer and weed and all kinds of stuff like paying for sex, paying for porn, paying for all kinds of trash, and then we pass an offering bucket and you freak out. I might as well just get it all out there today. We already had people walk out. I want you to come back, but I'm not going to change. I'm not, I'm not going to water down the gospel. But you, you ever see that? Somebody, hey, come on, we're having a barbecue. Bring a 12-pack. I got that. Hey, we're taking up an offering for diapers. Oh, God, no. no. We had somebody in the church. If we could raise $25,000, I got somebody that'll match the other $25,000. That's $50,000. We can change our city. Pastor Todd, I don't got 50. You got a $5 bill? You got a couple bucks? Throw it in there. Say it's for the baby stuff. Let's get $50,000 in this church. And it's all going to go out. We're not going to keep it. We're not getting new cars. We're not getting new curtains. We're not getting stained glass. All the Baptist people were like, that come in. That come in. Okay. We're not getting a crucified Jesus for all you came out of the Catholic Church. We're not getting that either. He ain't there no more. So here's what I want to do, man. I want to, I'm, I'm hopped up. I'm sorry. I got fired up, man. I'm th we had no room at the early service for altar. Everybody came to the altar. You know why? Because whether they, they were trying to find Jesus for the first time or the thousandth time, I'm one of those guys. I found him for the, I don't know if you, I don't, I can't do math. So it was a lot of times, right? A lot of times. I'm glad that he, he's omnipotent and can keep up with all that stuff. And I don't have to. Because it doesn't matter how many times, it just matters about the time, okay? So if you don't know Jesus, I'm fixing to give you an opportunity. If you've known him and you've fallen away from him, I'm going to give you an opportunity, right? Author words, just come real quick, okay? Listen to it. If you're not doing anything with your gifts and talents, I'm going to give you, come let's pray for you. You know why most of you, can I tell you what 90% of you don't use your gifts and talents? Because you're scared. I'm scared. What are you scared of? failing good good because it's not long longer by Christ that lives in me not me I don't live in my Christ lives in me it's not me so Jesus can't fail but you can fail to be obedient and then they never get the offer. how many people in your circle their lives would have changed if you just would have been obedient to invite them to church we invite them to the bar we invite them to get high we invite them to the barbecue I'm not lying you know I'm true some of you are here today because, you know, we're going to do the barbecue later. We're going to get turned up. How about you get turned up on Jesus? And I can tell you, if you get a drink from this well, you'll never thirst again. You'll never thirst again. You won't want to get drunk anymore. You won't want to get high. I'm the, you want, your desires start becoming his desires. Does it happen like that? No, but it's a process. It's a process. And when you start living your life for him, things in your life will begin to change. I didn't go to the altar call and immediately get up and I wasn't a drug addict anymore. I still wanted to get high. But you know what I did? I stuck in the word. I chased him more. I chased him more. My desires began to change. Why well, I didn't want to get high anymore. But you got to change your circle too. I mean, you can't be riding in a car with everybody smoking weed. And you're like, I'm just here to share the gospel of Jesus with you all today. And <laughs> Contact high. Hello. Come on. Some, remember when you didn't have no money? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Jesus, bless this in spite of all my ignorance. 
So let's bow our heads. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to us today? Is there some people in this room that need to come know you today? There's just some people that knew you and, and for whatever reason, they, they, they went back. Doesn't matter the reason, it's irrelevant, but it's time to come back to Jesus. Is there people here that you've been sitting on your gifts and your callings and your talents and, and you know that you need to get back into it? The worship team's gonna sing a song and as they sing, I just want you to come